Thank you for joining us for this sermon. We are currently in a foundational series here at Hope called The Life of a Jesus Follower. As we make our way through this sermon series, we want to come alongside you and your family. That is why we launched JesusFollower.com. This website is full of helpful resources for you and your family. Before we get to the sermon, we just wanna make you aware of a couple things. First, we'd love to connect with you. You can follow us on our social networks by searching at Hope Church LV. Also, be sure to check out our website, HopeChurchOnline.com. There, you can find out more information about who we are and where we're headed as a church. Once again, thanks for checking out our sermon here at Hope Church. Enjoy the message. Amen. I became a follower of Jesus when I was in college. Now, I had been raised in a Christian environment. I was raised in and around the church, but it wasn't until I was a freshman in college that I began a personal relationship with God. But because I'd grown up in and around Christianity, when I became a Christian, a follower of Jesus, when I began a relationship with God, I made a serious mistake. And here's what I mean by that. I began to equate spiritual maturity with spiritual activity, meaning the more stuff I did for Jesus, the more I felt Jesus was happy with me. I felt like Jesus had done so much for me in saving me that it was now my responsibility to begin to live the Christian life. And so I set out on this journey of trying to be a good Christian. I read a quote by a man named Henry Blackaby that really epitomized the first decade of my Christian journey. It's, he, he said this. He said, we are, sa- we are so activity-oriented that we assume we are saved for a task to perform rather than for a relationship to enjoy. That's where I was living. I thought Jesus did so much for me. Now it's up to me to live for him. It's my responsibility. And so for the first decade of my Christian life, I tried hard to be a good Christian. I tried to measure up to what I thought God expected of me. And and based on my performance, that was the operative word, my performance as a Christian, my emotion rose and fell. I felt like there was a report card that I would receive from God based on how I measured up to being a good Christian. There were even verses in the Bible that made no sense to me because I was trying so hard to be a good Christian and yet I would come to a gathering like this in a church and I'd look around at everybody else and figure out or try to figure out how do they all have it all together and I'm the only one that's messed up. I would look at them, you know, we come at church on Sunday and we got our Sunday face on, like we got it all together, man, we're doing everything right. And How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing great. Everything's good in my life. And I'd look at that and I would think I was the only one who was broken. Let me give you an example of the verses that made no sense to me. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus, or Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you, I've underlined some words for you, say it out loud. Oh, that's a good word. Amen. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, so you may find rest for your souls. For my yoke is, say it out loud, and my burden is, let's just say the three underlined words out loud. You ready? One, two, three. Rest. (laughs) You could not have picked three words further removed from my experience of Christianity than rest, easy, and are you kidding me? And don't look at me spiritual, all right? If you'd have said, hey, Vance, why don't you pick three words to describe your Christianity? I would have said work, hard, and heavy. 
That's what Christianity felt like to me. I'd entered into this relationship with Jesus, and now it's hard work for me to carry the heavy load of being a good Christian, and I'm supposed to work as hard as I can to do that. I'll show you another verse. Jesus said in John chapter 8, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you. Oh, anybody want some freedom today? Listen, I didn't have freedom. I just exchanged one set of bondage for another set of bondage. I was now trying to measure up. I was trying to perform. I was trying to live up to a standard that was completely unattainable. And then, to make matters worse... By this point in my Christian journey, I was already pastoring. So I'm preaching this gospel and I'm saying words like easy light and free and rest. And I'm hoping somehow they just got it more than I got it. And long story short, it led me to a point of brokenness in my own life spiritually. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know what I mean when I say a place of spiritual brokenness. It's one of those moments when God kind of knocks the props out from under you. He removes that which makes you comfortable. And you get to a place of real desperation for Him. And it was in that moment of desperation that I came to the greatest discovery of my life. And that is that Jesus is enough. Listen. It's not Jesus plus being a good Christian. It's not Jesus plus measuring up. It's just Jesus. And in that broken period in my life, God brought a mentor into my life. And some of you that have been coming to Hope for any length of time, you've heard me quote this guy. His name is Clyde Cranford. Clyde was a man that God brought into my life to just begin to disciple me and pour into me and to teach me what it meant to pursue Christ and Christ alone and begin to live out of the resources of Christ in me. And Clyde was just one of those, he was one of those guys that just was, the only word I know is just godly. You know, you meet some people, it's like when they walk in the room, it's like the presence of God just is on them. That was Clyde. Clyde died in his mid-40s. Went home to be with the Lord. Here's, how, here's, here's the man of God he was. Here's how they found him, dead in his living room, with a Bible in one hand, notebook in the other hand, spending time at the feet of Jesus here. Took his last breath, and he's looking at Jesus face to face. It was like a new, test or, or a new model of Enoch who just walked with God, and then he just wasn't anymore. He just went to heaven. Clyde taught me a principle that, that turned my life upside down. I want to put it up here on the screen. Here's the principle. The primary call on my life is not to do something for Jesus. The primary call on my life is to be with Jesus. Wow. You know what that is? Freedom. You know what that is? That's easy. That's rest. Here's what, here's what I begin to understand. Everything Jesus desired to do through my life, he would do out of the overflow of the relationship that I already had with him. Everything he would accomplish through my life, he would accomplish out of the overflow of what he's doing in my life. And we began to talk about this last weekend in particular. We're in a series right now called The Life of a Jesus Follower, unpacking what it looks like to faithfully follow Jesus. And I hope, I pray that through this series, you begin to experience the freedom and the rest where you don't live like I used to live. I used to live thinking that God's operative word to define his perspective towards me as a Christian was disappointment. That God was just always disappointed with me. Because I could never measure up. But when I began to learn these truths, it began to set me free to understand I'm a loved, accepted child of the Father based on who I am in Christ, not how I live for Christ. And everything Jesus desires to do through my life, he'll do out of the overflow of what he's already doing in my life. So we're unpacking that. And what I want to do this morning is dig deeper into this question, why is spending time, why is being with Jesus so important? And listen, when you hear me say spending time with Jesus, being with Jesus, I don't want you to put that in a box because we tend to immediately hear that and think about what we call in Christianity the quiet time or the God time or our devotional life. 
And I'm not saying that's not significant. That's a big part of it. Time alone with God that you carve out daily to be in his presence, that's the beginning place of abiding in Christ. But abiding in Christ is also living moment by moment out of the overflow of an intimate fellowship relationship with Jesus that I don't leave in a box in my quiet time, but as I work, as I live, as I shop, as I do life, Christ in me living through me out of the overflow of that fellowship. So why is this thing of being with him or spending time with him so important? So I want to answer that question by asking three more questions. Now, but but here's what I want to tell you. I don't want you to answer these questions out loud. I so appreciate how you talk back to me when I preach. It is so encouraging. It blesses my heart so much. I love it. But I'm about to ask some questions I do not want you to answer out loud, okay? So let's say it together. I'm not going to answer out loud. Let's say it. I'm not going to answer out loud. I'm trying to save you and me both some embarrassment, all right? Now, when Clyde asked me these three questions, I didn't get that privilege. I answered out loud and made a mess of it. So I don't want you to do that. So you're going to want to answer this out loud because you're going to see this question. You're going to think, I know the answer to that, but don't answer out loud. So three questions. Number one. Does a Christian, don't, 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 don't answer. Does a Christian want to sin? Clyde asked me that question sitting across the desk from me. And I was fresh out of seminary. And I didn't even hardly let him finish the question until I was answering it. Well, of course. I mean... That's why it's tempting, right? Temptation would not be temptation if I did not want to sin. So, of course, Clyde, of course as a Christian I want to sin. And he let me talk myself into this hole. And then he began to just lead me out of that by helping me understand. In one sense, yes, it's true. In our flesh, as long as we are human beings on this earth, we are going to struggle with sin. We will. We have a flesh. Listen, don't let the enemy convince you somehow that you've gotten to a place spiritually where you're above it because you're not. Our flesh is not getting better. It's getting worse. Our flesh still longs for the things of this world. But listen, we are no longer our flesh. Christ has come to live inside of us. Christ has given us a new heart, a new being. And now on the inside, no, we as Christians genuinely don't want to sin. And let me prove it to you. As soon as you do, how does it feel? As soon as the Christian makes that choice... To disobey God. Here's what we discover immediately. That's not what I wanted at all. We thought we did. Our flesh convinced us that we did. But it's not what we want. It's what we read a moment ago in Philippians. It's God who's at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. What he's now put in us is a heart that longs to please God. And as a Christian, you'll never be satisfied until you're living a life of pleasing the Father in every moment of every day. That's real satisfaction. So the answer is no. The Christian in their heart of hearts now doesn't want to sin. So then he asked me a second question. Don't answer out loud. Does a Christian have to sin. Now, I'd so buried myself in a hole in the first question that I was a little hesitant answering the second one. And Clyde could read my hesitancy. So he said, before you answer, let me show you two verses of Scripture, two places in the Scripture. So he said, turn to Romans chapter 6. Let me show it to you. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and 7 says this, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. Did you hear all the past tense nature of that? It was crucified so that it might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is what? Say it out loud. Freed from what? Sin. I'm dead in Christ. It's already happened. I've been set free. He could tell on my face I still wasn't convinced. So he said, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Look at this. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is, say it out loud. 
Did you hear that? God is what? It didn't say you are faithful. It didn't say I am faithful. But it said in every moment of temptation, God is what? Faithful to do what? He who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able and with the temptation will provide a way of what? Escape so that you may be able to endure it. Here's what that says. In Christ, I'm already dead to sin. I've been set free. And in every moment of temptation, Christ is going to be faithful to give me an escape, a way out by his grace. I still wasn't convinced. I said, fresh out of seminary, Clyde, what about my depravity? It's a theological term for the fallenness of the human condition. Depravity is defined like this. Apart from the grace of God, we would all run headlong into every form of wickedness. That's what depravity means. Depravity means we're not good We're bad. We come into this world dead to God and alive to sin. That's why you don't have to teach boys and girls to be bad. you got to teach them to be what? Why is that? Because bad comes what? Naturally. It means it's our nature. We're bent towards doing that which is opposite of what God would have us to do. And I said, Clyde, you're asking me the question, does a Christian have to sin? Well, my flesh is depraved. It longs for the things of this world. He said, that's true. Apart from the grace of God, you run headlong into every form of sin. But he said, Romans 5, 2 says, as a Christian, the grace of God is now that in which we stand. We never have to live apart from the grace of God. There's never one millisecond for the life of a Christian where you are ever separated or apart from the grace, the amazing grace of God. He said, not only that, look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that His, that's God's, divine power has granted to us everything. It's a word in the Greek language that means totality. God, by His power, has given who? Us. Talking to Christians. Everything. What? Pertaining to life and God in us. Everything, the totality of what, listen, you don't need some second awakening. You don't need some second experience. You don't need more knowledge. The moment, you, when did we get this? Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and exodus. The moment you came to know Jesus, everything you need to live life in a godly way, Jesus gave you by his power. So, does a Christian have to sin? No. So then he asked me a third question. And let me go ahead and tell you up front. This third one stings. He said, Vance, if a Christian doesn't want to sin, and a Christian doesn't have to sin, here it is. Why do we sin? Because let's just be honest today, all right? Can we be honest? We're in church. It's okay, right? We can be honest. I'm not looking at a crowd of sinless perfection. Is that okay to say amen right there? Hey, and you're not looking up here at sinless perfection, and my wife's over here, and she doesn't need to say anything, right? Amen. I don't need a loud amen this morning, babe. That's all right. But we just saw in Scripture, we don't have to sin. We don't want to sin. Then... And to be honest, at this point, Clyde's asking me these questions. I was done answering out loud. (laughs) Not just because I was embarrassed. To be real honest, I didn't know. I literally had no answer. And he let me sit there and think on that for a minute. And then he said, Vance, I want you to open your Bible. And this is where I want you to turn your Bible. Everything else I'm going to say is going to come out of one verse. John chapter 14, verse 15. Listen to what it says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Here's how I'd heard that verse until that moment my whole Christian life. Here's what I'd always heard. If you 
love me, you better obey me. I heard I've got to show him I love him by my performance. Now, when you hear it that way, where does your focus shift? The focus is on what? Keeping his commandments, right? Because I got to obey him. I got to make sure I'm dotting every I, crossing every T. That's the way I'd heard that verse my whole Christian life, man. If I love him, I got to show him by obeying him. And that time in that moment right there with Clyde, I heard it like I'd never heard it before. Here's what he said. If you love me, <laughs> you will keep my commandments. Emphasis not on keeping the commandments. Emphasis on loving Him. Here's what I I learned in that moment. Obedience is not the focus of my life as a believer. Obedience is the fruit of my life as a believer as I focus on an intimate love relationship with Jesus. Obedience is what he begins to produce through my life out of the overflow of a love relationship with him. Clyde looked at me and he said, Vance, your obedience is in direct proportion to your love. He said, Vance, let me tell you why you struggle with that area of sin in your life. Here's why. Because you love that more than you love him. He said, you sin because you don't love God. Now, 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 again, I'm being honest. I got angry, like angry enough that I wanted to dive across the desk and take him out angry. Like, how dare you? Have you not watched me for the last 10 years of my life try so very hard to be? How dare you say I don't love God? The problem was it was right there in the book. Jesus drew a direct line between my intimate love relationship with him and the obedience that flows out of my life. So I want to show you this in a little bit of a paradigm this morning. I want to put this up here, and I'm going to start with the word sin. We've said that we sin. The reason we do is because we don't love God. Now, again, Clyde was not saying that I didn't love him at all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we don't love God at all. I did love him. I just didn't love him like I could love him. So that raises the question, why don't we love God more? Now, here's the answer. Because we don't know God. Again, not that we don't know him at all. We don't know him like we could know him. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, let me try to illustrate it. May the 23rd of 1992. I stood in front of a crowd just like this. It'll be 28 years ago this May. I stood before that crowd with this lady right over here, Christy. And I asked, or we we, we exchanged our vows and we uh, told each other we loved each other. We'd known each other for 10 months. And I told her, Christy, I love you and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And a pastor pronounced us husband and wife and we were married. We declared publicly our love for each other. But listen to me. I love her today like I could have never loved her 28 years ago because I know her today like I didn't know her back then. You see, today I know her as a wife, a life giver, a life partner, a mother, a Jesus follower, a person who is leveraging their life for the sake of the mission of God. I know her as somebody who's willing to sacrifice and serve and give and forgive and and be patient. I know her in so many ways today that I could never have known her, that now I love her like I could have never loved her back then. You know the problem with most Christians? Our knowledge of God begins and ends with John 3.16. Now, don't misunderstand me. John 3.16 is a good verse. Amen? 
I mean, it's a good verse. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting or eternal life. Hey, that's good news. If you are thankful for the truth of God revealed in John 3, 16, say amen. amen. The good news of Jesus. But listen, that's one verse. There are 31,101 other verses in this book. And every one of them contain a treasure chest of the truth about the glory of God, the majesty of God, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the provision of God, the long-suffering nature of God, the mercy of God, the majesty of God. All of that is a treasure chest. And God has invited us into relationship with himself so that we can know him. And the more we know him, the more we love him. Listen, there's never anything about God you're going to learn you don't love. Now, you may not like it in the moment, but you'll love it. I promise you. So that begs another question. Why don't we know God more? Here's the answer. We don't spend time with God. We don't spend time with God. I said a moment ago that I know my wife like I could not have known her 28 years ago. What's made all the difference in the world? 28 years, right? 28 years of time together. You know how you get to know somebody? There's one answer. T-I-M-E. That's it. The only way to deepen, grow, develop any relationship is time. We have spent 28 years doing life together. What if I had proposed to my wife like this? I got down on one knee. And said, Christy, I love you more than any person on planet Earth, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you, and here's how it's going to work. I'm going to come see you every Sunday morning. Well, unless the ball game is on, or the weather is, you know, cloudy, But other than that, every Sunday morning, I'm going I'm to come see you. I tell you what, I'm going to do better than that. One night a week, I'm going to get a small group of people together, and we're going to hang out together with a small group. Somebody's house. Just you and me hanging out with a bunch of people in their house. Now, other than that, you're not going to see me very much. Oh, wait a minute, unless I need something. Now, 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 if I need something, I'm going to blow your phone up. Matter of fact, I'm not just going to blow your phone up. I'm going to get all my friends to blow your phone up. Because when I need something, I need it, and I need it right now. Now, no man in his right mind is going to extend a proposal to a woman to be married like that, right? Especially within arm's reach of that woman, right? And no woman in her right mind is ever going to accept a marriage proposal like that, right? Why? Because that's not what? That's not a relationship. Matter of fact, it's so not a relationship, we're laughing about it because it's literally ridiculous. God, I want you to be the center of my life. You are the most important thing. I surrender everything to you, God. And here's the deal. I'm going to come see you on Sunday. Unless it's time change Sunday or. <laughs> Lord, I'll do better than that. I, I'm going to get a group of people together once a week. We're going to call it a small group. We're going to get in somebody's house. Now, other than that, Lord, I, I, you're not going to see. No, wait, 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 wait. Listen, I need something then I'm going to become a prayer warrior. Not only that, I'm going to get all my friends to be prayer warriors. Listen, and we wonder why this thing called Christianity doesn't work. Let me tell you why. Because before it's anything else, it's a relationship. And there's only one way to develop a relationship, and that's time. 
We must choose to invest time in our relationship with Jesus, abiding in him. Well, that leads to another question. Why don't we spend the time with God that we know is necessary? Here's why. We don't see the need. Let me ask you a question. How many of you think that time alone with Jesus daily is a good thing? Let me see your hand. Just hold it up for a second. Just hold it up. Classroom participation time. Just hold them up for a second. That's what I thought. You can put them down. How many of you think that spending time alone with Jesus every day would benefit and bless your life? Let me see your hand. Just hold it up. Let me see. That's what I thought. You can put them down. How many of you believe that spending time alone with Jesus would not only change your life, it would change your marriage, it would change your job, it would change your, it would change everything. How many of you believe that? Let me see your hand. That's what I thought. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Okay. I got it. I got it. You can put them down. How many of you believe spending time alone with Jesus daily is absolutely a necessity? Let me see your hand. Oh, hang on now. Hang on now. Well, I know we're in church, but we ain't got that much confession time, all right? (laughs) Necessity means I can't live today without it. Necessity is breathing. How many of you breathe every day? (laughs) Right? Matter of fact, you stop breathing, you stop what? Living. You stop breathing right now, we'll tend to you when the service is over, right? Nothing we can do for you right this minute, so we're going to keep going. (laughs) You eat every day? Yeah, why? Because you don't breathe, you don't eat, you don't sleep, you don't what? You don't live. What did Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do what? You know the problem with that? Here's what we think he said. Apart from me, you can't do big things. Let a big thing come up in your life, and guess what? you got time to be with Jesus. Let the doctor tell you you got six months to live. Let your wife tell you I'm leaving. Let your kid find them way, their, their way out of the house, and you don't know where they are. And guess what? You all of a sudden just got your schedule freed up to do. Be much alone with Jesus. But let it be an ordinary, regular day, and you can say, you know what? I think I got this one today. I'm good. I can skip that. That's not necessity. Here's what we really think. We really think time alone with Jesus is a really, 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 really good option. It's an option. Well, why don't we see the need? Pride. You know what pride says? Pride says to God, God, I don't need you. Now, there's not a person in this room that's going to get up in the morning, get in your car, head out for the day, and before you get out, roll down your window, look out your head and say, God, I don't need you today. I'm good. But every day we choose to live out of the overflow of intimacy with the Father, that's exactly what we're saying. I have four children. My youngest turned 16 on Friday. We've just taught our last one how to drive. Praise Jesus. Amen. (laughs) But if you've got children or grandchildren, you understand that all children reach a stage of development where they go through a period of independence. Now, if you're parents of new children and you think you're experiencing that for the first time, let me just encourage you, it won't be the last time. It comes, it waves, and it over and over again repeats itself. This thing of independence. For our family, it usually started when they were two years old with tying the shoes. Let me set the scene. Everybody's loaded up in the van. We're trying to get out the door. We're headed somewhere. Last little one. Doesn't have shoes on. Hey, 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 let daddy help you. Put your shoes on. Let's go. We got everybody's in the car. We got to go. We got to go. Let's put them on. And here's what you get. I'm going to do it myself. Now, I got just enough spite in me to say, all right, help yourself. (laughs) And you know what that looks like. They take that string, and they're wrapping it around their leg. They're going around the bottom of their shoe, doing everything they can to get that shoe tied. Until finally, out of complete frustration, they come back and say, Daddy, will you help me? Then what do we do? We sit down. We put them in our lap. Get this. We take their little hands, and we put them in ours. We say, now here's what you do. You take this lace, you put it over here, you pull it through, and then you make a loop, and you tie it, and you pull that bow, and then we let go. And there's that little one holding that bow on that shoe. 
And they look up and go, Daddy, I just tied my shoe. (laughs) Now all the while, you know you tied that shoe. Listen, you did it through them. Listen, our Father, every day is waiting to pour forth His grace. You know what grace is? Grace is God doing for me in me and through me, what I could not do on my own. That is grace. Every morning, He's ready to pour out His grace so that through us, He can do what we cannot do on our own. And yet, how many mornings? God, I'm going to do it myself. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Let me show it to you in the Bible. James chapter 4, verse 6. Look at this. But he gives a... Say that word out loud. Listen, I think grace by itself is awesome. Amen? But he says he'll give a greater... You know what that Greek word is? It's the Greek word we've transliterated into English, mega. Anybody want a mega dose of grace? It says he gives mega grace. When? It says, God is opposed to the proud. Here's what that means. When you say, God, I don't need you, God says, all right, help yourself. The word opposed means to stiff arm. But he says, he gives grace, mega grace to the what? Humble. What does humility say? Pride says, God, I don't need you. Humility says, God, I need you. God, I'm desperate. So let me flip the paradigm. What if we, instead of having pride, start with humility? And every day is a day where we live out of this reality. God, I'm desperate for you. I can't be the husband. I can't be the father. I can't be the co-worker. I can't be the employer. I can't be the neighbor. Lord, I am desperate for you. What did the verse say? He gives what? Grace. And when we see that grace, guess what happens? We begin to see the need. When we see the need, we begin to spend time with God. When we spend time with God, we begin to know God. The more we know God, the more we love God. And guess what? The more we love God, if you love me, if you love me. I think every genuine Christian in this room says their heart's desire is to obey God. You'll never get there focused on obeying God. Your willpower, your determination is not enough you got to get to a place of desperation that manifests itself through intimate fellowship with the Father where you grow to know Him, and the more you love Him, guess what happens? Obedience spills out of your life. Let me close this this morning by showing you one final little drawing up here. Because I know here's what happens on a day like today. On a day like today, we all have temptation. We struggle. So I'm going to put the word temptation up here. And this, this, what I'm about to show you can apply to any area of temptation in your life. But I specifically want to talk about the temptation to not be alone with Jesus. To not live abiding in Christ. Because we all face that every day. If, if, if we say we don't, we're lying. We all face it every day. We get busy. We got our things to do. So we're going to face this temptation. Some of you came in today realizing that temptation to not be with him. And you've heard this today like I've heard it many times before in conferences or read it in books or heard it on podcasts about being alone with Jesus, being intimate with the Father. And here's what we've said already. Some of you have already said this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this, man. You're right. That's so right. So starting tomorrow morning. I'm going to set my alarm clock early. I'm going to lay my Bible out. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be alone with Jesus. I am going to do this. I know I've said this before, but this time I'm serious. I really mean it. I'm going to do this. And you know what happens? For a little bit, we, we succeed. You might go all week this week, have quiet times, get time alone with God. You may live out of the overflow of intimacy with Christ every day this week, and you're going to come in here next week like this. I did it. All week long. Man, I got it going on. It's happening. And then you know what's going to happen, right? We're going to fail. We're going to miss a day. We're going to miss an opportunity. And then you know what happens, right? 
Oh, I'm so disappointed in myself. Gosh, I could have done better. Why? Why can't I do this? And the guilt and the condemnation begins to set in that God's disappointed in you, that you've not measured up to what he expects you to be. Then you go back to a conference, get you a new book, go hear another preacher, and you get confronted with this all over again. You say, doggone it, this time I'm going to do it. Maybe this time you make it a month. Now you're starting to tell everybody, hey, I can teach you how to do this. I can teach you how to have a quiet time. I can, I can show you a system. I can be an accountability partner now. It's for real. And then the embarrassment's even worse because now you've told everybody else. And now you feel like a double failure. So disappointed. And Drop the circle in here. You know what this is? Clyde called it the merry-go-round of the flesh. And unfortunately, this is where most Christians live. From commitment to commitment, from try harder, do better mentality, because of pride trying to live the Christian life on their own. Can I close by showing you another way? Here's a word, same word, temptation. How about today we start right here? Lord, I can't. Not only I can't, I won't. I know me. I know who I am apart from you. I know the choices I'll make. I know the thoughts I'll dwell on. I know the emotions of my heart that will wrap around. Lord, I can't do this. You know what that is? That's humility. You know what we get when we approach him that way? Get this. What is grace? God doing for, in, and through me what I could not do on my own. And when we experience grace, guess what we experience? Look at this. Victory! Listen, that's the promise of Jesus, that we can walk in victory. And victory is not, look what I've done. Victory is, look what he did. You come, you get around some Christians, they go, man, something's different about you. What's going on? It's not, look what I did. It's, man, look what Jesus has done. And guess what? God gets the glory. Now, this doesn't mean we won't still battle this. We will. Victory is not deliverance. Deliverance means I never struggle. That's not promised until we get to heaven. Victory is victory in the midst of the struggle through the power of Christ in me as I live in dependence on Him and He pours out His grace. Let me put the circle in there. This is what Clyde called the ascending spiral of grace. You know what needs to happen today? Some of you that are already Christians, for the first time in a long time, need to stop trying to commit to do something God never designed nor intended. Listen, it's not even possible for you to live the Christian life. Only Christ in you. Apart from Him, we can do what? Listen to the opposite of that. Jesus said... Through him, in Philippians chapter 4, through Christ, I can do what? All things. How? Through him who strengthens me. Apart from him, nothing. Through him, all things. Say it out loud. Apart from him, nothing. Through him, all things. Apart from him, nothing. Through him, all things. That's the victory. Let me tell you what that is. Freedom. rest let's pray Father in the name of Jesus I pray that as only you can this morning you would speak these truths into our life God I pray for Christians that are here already this morning that already know you God I pray for them that in this moment they would experience freedom God, maybe in a few moments, these altars need to be filled with some believers just coming to make a fresh surrender. Just for the first time in a long time, say, I can't, Lord. I can't. I need you. I need you. There just needs to be a fresh surrender. 
Listen, some of you have been living with the bondage of religion, trying to do good, be good, be a better Christian. Listen, it's time to stop trying and start trusting in the grace of Jesus to do what you can't do on your own. In a moment, we're going to open these altars, and you can come just be alone with God. But also today, there's some here in this room, you're not even a Christian yet. You don't know Jesus. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, man, I, I can't become a Christian. I'm not ready to live the Christian life. Listen, if you wait to be able to live the Christian life to become a Christian, let me tell you what, you're never going to become a Christian because you can't live the Christian life. That's not even what he asks us to do. He desires to live it through us. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, just like we had in the last service, maybe you want to come today to one of our pastors here at the front. You can just say to them today, I need Jesus. That's all you got to say. This Jesus who died on a cross for your sin. This Jesus who rose again so that you could be forgiven and so that you could experience his life, the freedom, the rest, the peace, the joy, the satisfaction. If you'll just come to one of our pastors today and simply say, I need Jesus. We'll have somebody sit down with you and open a Bible and show you how you can begin a personal relationship with God today. Maybe you're here and you got religion, but for the first time in your life, you realize I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know him at all. And you want to come and give your life to Christ today. Or maybe you're here and there's another burden on your heart. You want to just pray. You can pray in the altar. You can pray with one of our pastors. About something in your job, your health, your family, your marriage, whatever it is. Holy Spirit of God, we invite you in this moment to have your way. Lord, do what only you can do. And we thank you for how you're going to move. It's in the mighty name of Jesus.